a glass to the past And the ladies cross the ages Fallen fathers from the motherland Whose lives are on the pages And the bottle said it best When he told us all the world's a stage So fellas, grab a glass And lift your spirits to the seventh age Welcome one and all to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time for us to pour up our glasses, pull up chairs, and gather together here in our favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub. I tell you, with all the cool weather that's been happening all throughout the Southeast recently, there's one thing on my mind right now. Apart from sitting down behind this microphone, pouring up a glass, and chatting with my pals, and gentlemen, that involves getting out on the trail and hiking this spring. Appalachian Trail, anybody? You know, I've had a bunch of friends who've been saying we should get a group of us together and we should all hike at least a portion of the Appalachian Trail. Have either of you ever done that? There's a lot of people that section hike the trail, and uh, I had actually considered doing that myself. I've never been on the Appalachian Trail. However, I have section hiked other trails. There's a lot of good trails around the southeast. There's also one called the Palmetto Trail, which is basically going in a different direction. But yeah, both of those are easily done in sections. Um, and then you know how it's, as you go to each different section, they all kind of offer a little bit different terrain, a little bit different uh, look and feel. So yeah, it would be cool to check out some of the different parts. Yeah, one that uh, is my favorite, and this is over in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, uh, the Alum Cave Trail, which actually technically takes you to the, to the summit of Mount LeConte. And that's a good round trip, 10 mile hike up and, and back. And I did that last summer. And let me tell you, that is not an easy hike, so you, you definitely want to make sure you're in perfect shape before you get out and you take to the trail. But you know what's interesting about that one is when you actually get to what's called Alum Cave, it's not really a cave at all, but I guess you would probably define it as a rock shelter or a re-entrant uh, with the, the way that the erosional features have kind of created, again, what they call the cave. It's really just this great big overhanging rock, but I've always kind of wondered about it and whether there might be anything of archaeological significance there. And that kind of is concerning to me because if it is and it's never been excavated my worry is that there may have been people who've gone up there and tried to you know dig around looters essentially who would go up there dig through the through the soil remove anything that they could with with little regard for protection of or or maintaining the environment again it comes back to something that a couple of episodes back when we talked about the meadowcroft rock shelter that uh, that you said james that in all your hiking that you've done over the years you've seen Again, what you might say, dozens, if not hundreds, of areas just like that. How many more places are there out there where early human habitation sites could exist that have never been explored? Certainly, and that's exactly what I was talking about. You can go out on almost any trail, and you're going to see some type of a overhang or a rock shelter or something like that. And honestly, anytime you see one of those, I, I suspect that it's at least been partially habitated or used as a, you know, as a temporary shelter. Um, during bad weather, I've done it personally many times. I didn't I, leave anything behind because we have a new kind of a, our modern concept is like a leave no trace um, type of a mindset when you go backpacking. But I don't know that, uh, you know, uh, paleo Indians or people back in history, you know, if they needed to discard something, they just discarded it. I actually know of a place and I'm not going to mention it here because, I, you know, again, I'm terrified of the idea of people going out there and trying to loot different locations but i know of a place where a kind of it's it's more like a cave although it's not a karstic kind of a cave or anything it's it would be technically uh, a a natural formation as a result of of rock formations and things that forms a a natural uh shelter but i look at this and i'm thinking people had to have stayed in this and again there's no evidence i to my knowledge can't think of any time that there would have been any professional excavation that would have occurred at this location so again there are so many locations uh, not just throughout the Southeast, probably all over the world that that hold these ancient secrets about the past. And I'm always thinking to myself, what have we not learned? What are we waiting to find? And some of us may know where these locations are, but we haven't even gone looking. And for those who know where these locations potentially may be, why has no one gone to look? And well, there's always that dichotomy, if you will. You have professional academics who are looking for new places to you know excavate and gain knowledge from. And then you have a lot of private landowners who have sites um, that they have access to, but they never bother to go, you know, investigate. And then, of course, you have the ever-present issues with looting and trespassing and all the things that go along with that, um, that, you know, kind of creates the divide between the two. So definitely no shortage of rock shelters. And again, how many of them has been explored? How many of them has been explored properly? Probably actually very few. You know, one thing that kind of came to mind when we were talking about this is, 
a lot of these rock shelters like I talk about that I know of, you run into these things along the trail. And one thing about backpacking, especially if you do section hiking, sometimes it can be 30, 20, 30, 50 mile hike. So you carry as little weight as possible. So you're not going to carry a shovel or any kind of implement or anything unless you were going in there specifically for that purpose. Yeah. So most of the time, I would say that's probably why most of those things stay unexcavated. They're just too far you know, from a road or whatever. Absolutely. I'd kind of like to hear from people out there in the listening audience, you know, who have found this podcast or you're listening to it. We hope that you enjoy it. We always welcome feedback, but also from people who enjoy getting out, enjoying nature and hiking. There's a lot more that could be said in future programs about that and what that has to do, how it relates to not only protection of the wilderness, you know, from an environmental standpoint, but also archaeology, history, all these kind of things. Info at sevenages.org is the best catch-all general email to use to reach us. But of course, if you head over to sevenages.org, you can find articles and information about all of the hosts here and other contributors to that site. But on this discussion of unraveling the past through new discoveries, there is a big one that just within the last 24 hours has made headlines after it was published in the journal Nature, and BBC reports on this, that the 11,500-year-old remains of an infant girl from Alaska have shed new light on the peopling of the Americas, which not only Jason here, but I think all of us here at the Crosstime Pub probably have an appreciation for. The article continues to read, a genetic analysis of the child allied to other data indicates she belonged to a previously unknown ancient group. I've got a lot of questions about this, and we'll get into that a little bit more here in a moment. Scientists say what they have learned from her DNA strongly supports the idea that a single wave of migrants followed, uh, moved into the continent from Siberia just over 20,000 years ago. Lower sea levels back then would have created dry land in the Bering Strait. It would have submerged again only as northern ice sheets melted and retreated. The pioneering settlers became the ancestors of all today's Native Americans, this according to Professor Ersk Villerslev and colleagues. His team has published its genetics assessment in the journal Nature, as aforementioned. But again, this is rather novel because we have here the discovery of the remains of a child that date back to the Paleo-Indian period. This was a six-week-old infant. Uh, she was found uh, at the Upward Sun River Archaeological Site. The discovery was made back in 2013. Often the revelations are yet to be forthcoming for sometimes for years, and hence why in early 2018 we're only now hearing about this. The local indigenous community gave her a name in their native language, but this means sunrise girl child. The science team have designated her USR-1. But according to Professor Vilaslev and others who have worked with this, these are the oldest human remains ever found in the U.S. state of Alaska. But what is particularly interesting here is that this individual belongs to a population of humans that we have never seen before. Now, I'm really kind of confused about this because they say it's a population that is most closely related to modern Native Americans but is still distantly related to them. So you can say she comes from the earliest or most original Native American group. And that means she can tell us about the ancestors of all Native Americans. Now that's interesting because if she can tell us about the ancestry of all Native Americans and she belongs to a previously unidentified group, are they saying that she was the first or among the first, I should say? Well, with this discovery, it seems to be indicating the, the way that they were that's kind of a bit of a mystery to me. I would like a little bit more clarification on what exactly it is they mean by that. Right. Um, you know, previously we'd had the Anzic and uh, site in Montana that was considered to be the oldest and that was considered to be the only known Clovis burial. And, you know, they came up with basically the same findings at that particular site. Uh, in that case, they used bone shavings that were collected from the skull of this uh, 12 to 18 month old child. From that, they were able to reconstruct the full genome of that child. And uh, comparison studies of the ancient DNA showed that it was similar to the genomes of ancient people living in Siberia, um, also the ancestors of East Asians. So with that in mind, the team also discovered that a deep genetic affinity between the boy's genetic material and those of 52 different Native American populations living in South America and Canada were essentially the same. So the ANZIC was sort of that marker for us originally, but now it seems with the finding of this body that it may even be pushing that genetic line back even further uh, and even adding a bit of mystery to it. Yeah, and one of the other questions, again, we have here is what or how this relates to the concept of multiple migrations into the new world. What we seem to be seeing is that DNA evidence with haplogroups and, and other uh, methods of, of determining people's origin it all seems to point back to Siberia, which is strongly suggestive of people coming across Beringia, you know, the Bering Land Bridge. There is some anecdotal evidence, and there are some 
you know, theories that have offshoot from these that suggest such things as people from the Salutrian culture coming over from Europe at perhaps even an earlier time. I know Dennis Stanford, for instance, from the Smithsonian, has long been an advocate of the Clovis hunters having originated from Europe and that the Salutrian hypothesis, as it were, would be indicative of this. Again, the genetic information seems to be increasingly pointing to Siberia. But there are other theories as well. And there are many questions that remain, I think, uh, including, for instance, you know, the concentrations of of uh, Clovis discoveries and things in parts of the Southeast. Jason, I know that's a subject that's near and dear to your heart, of course, having grown up in the Southeast and becoming, uh, you know, I think aware of the prevalence of all this through your many years of study of archaeology in that region. Well, I think what we're going to eventually end up finding here is that, you know, there's probably was waves. It probably was various time periods. Uh, we, we know that to be the case when normal settling of areas happens. Um, sometimes there's one large wave and subsequent waves uh, thereafter. But uh, with this particular topic that we're talking about with, you know, the, the Asian versus the European uh, genetic lines, when, you know, ANZIC first came out, it was really marked as the, the cue point for all of these discussions. Now, Dennis Stanford does, you know, he is a large proponent of the Salutrian hypothesis, which he outlined with uh, Bruce Bradley in their book, Across Atlantic Ice. Um, and that was based off of some East Coast findings, which uh, we could talk about in depth in a whole nother show sometime, but uh, very interesting to say the least. Mm -hmm. But when the, uh, when the Anzac discovery first came out, uh, it received a lot of support from people like Michael Waters, who is the director of the Center for the Study of the First Americans at Texas A&M University. Um, and he was quoted at the time with the Anzac discovery as saying, this shows very clearly that the ancestry of the first Americans can be traced back to Asia. Um, also, David Anderson, uh, who's an anthropologist at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, he agreed with Waters on that statement, uh, quoting, there's been a standard model for a long time that modern Native Americans are descended from populations coming from East Asia a few thousand years before Clovis. Um, and that's what we're finding in these these two sites so both anzic and now this site in alaska seem to be supporting that yeah seem to be supporting it and really i think making the most conclusive argument to date about the ancestry of native americans uh, on the north american continent you know one of the other questions of course i guess that comes to mind is how they came into the north american continent and uh, you know again i still have questions about certain other things too because we look at sites like monte verde which uh, Tom Dillahay began excavating in the middle 1970s, this near Puerto Montt, Chile. And there are two sites at Monte Verde, one that's around 18,000 years old, and then one, correct me if I'm wrong, that goes all the way back to around 33,000, 35,000 years? Yeah, right in that range. I mean, that's extremely old. And one thing I've often wondered is whether or not, and actually, Dillahay wrote a really great book on migrations in the ancient world. I think it was actually called The Peopling of the Americas. And he notes everything from the possibility that there may have been people who came over from parts of Australia and New Zealand and that they maybe came and followed a southerly route and came down across and up through parts of South America. He notes certain genetic anomalies in eastern Brazil that may be in some way linked to western Africa and a possible connection between those two areas in the ancient world. And then the obvious genetic, the preponderance, I think, of genetic evidence that shows people coming across from Siberia. But again, one of those questions raised in that book and in others was, was there a land bridge that people followed that brought them onto the North American continent, i.e. the Bering Strait? And that's the long-held theory. Or were these people, much earlier than many had conceived that they might have been able to do, had they been using primitive watercraft to bop along the coast there and come down into the continent that way? Or was it a combination of the two, uh, in which case we still see an Asian departure, if you will, uh, whether it's by watercraft or whether it was by um, any other means, we still see that Asia seems to be the, the origin point there. Yeah, absolutely. It's really fascinating. I wouldn't just put my finger on any one and say conclusively without question, this is the only way people got into the Americas. That question, I think, is going to remain as we continue to not only look at all the varieties of ways and the, and the new evidence forthcoming, but also as we continue to find discoveries, perhaps, again, if the Saruti Mastodon site can be any indication of that, that push back the time frame on a lot of that. Kind of makes you think, what was in the water back in those days? And I actually tell you the truth, James, in, kind of in a segue here into something that you wanted to bring up, 
I know that there's something in the water elsewhere, which brings us back to the present day that a few people are concerned about. Yeah, normally when we uh, meet in the Crosstown Pub, I have a nice uh, pint in my hand, but tonight I have a glass of nice, clean, well-treated tap water. <laughs> and the reason I say it that way is recently I've I noticed a, in the news a, about a website or a company out on the West Coast selling what's called raw water. It's basically untreated spring water. This company's called Live Water. Over on their website, they've got a nice little write-up about how Mother Nature's untreated water is the purest substance on the planet and how it's really great for you and, and all that type of thing. That is somewhat misleading, I, I, at best, I think you could say. So I understand what the, what the guy is saying here, but however, I think this is really, is really kind of uh, bad advice. He, they, they talk about, and, and he's right, they talk about the synthetic toxins and that type of thing that are in, uh, in runoff and in uh, rivers and streams and lakes and that type of thing. Further on down in their website, they got a big, nice long write up, and it all sounds great about probiotics and minerals and, and whatnot. And they even urge people to collect their own spring water, which I urge you, please don't drink untreated water. The reason for that is, is there's lots of naturally occurring things, and even in spring water, that can be bad for you. There's natural contaminants, biologics like Giardia or Cryptosporidium or viruses or bacteria like fecal coliform, which is basically the uh, bacteria that lives in all warm-blooded animals' uh, digestive tracts. So even though it comes from a spring, does not mean it's not contaminated with these things. There's lots of uh, heavy metals that naturally occur, like uh, lead or arsenic or mercury. Radioactive elements can occur in um, natural spring water. Uranium is a naturally occurring mineral that's mined out of the ground. Oh, how lovely. <laughs> Uranium in your drinking water. <laughs> yeah, it's, there was a Washington Post article on this which I'll quote from here, it, it says the proponents of the raw water are selling the idea that drinking water contains things that they say the way nature intended, you know, chemical free and whatnot. Um, but like I said, there's dangerous bacteria, parasites uh, that I left out of there. So, yeah, there is some, sometimes there's some issues with, uh, with treated water. And, you know, everybody's heard of Detroit and their lead problem or whatever. In the United States, we have incredibly safe drinking water. I mean, we really do, especially compared to other countries, even our neighbors like go to Mexico, try to get a case of Montezuma's revenge and you'll see how you feel about raw water. Yeah, I mean, clean water is actually one of the biggest health concerns in the entire world. Um, as we all know, we must have water to survive. And when your only water source is a polluted one, um, there's a whole host of health issues that you can only begin to imagine uh, that people in the United States have never even dreamt of because we're just used to having treated uh, safe water to drink. And even those, you know, out in rural areas who aren't on city water supplies, who draw from a well, um, sometimes you can have issues with that as well. That water still needs to be tested. But uh, generally speaking, in this country, uh, we don't have the problems that you see, except in a few isolated cases like you see with Flint, Michigan, like you mentioned um, there have been outbreaks, but we also have safety systems in line. So like, for instance, when a water line is opened, um, there'll be a public service announcement that goes out. There'll be phone calls, there'll be texts, there'll be things on the local news that tell you, boil your water, there's a water advisory, things like that to help you uh, stay safe when you're interacting with that substance. However, if you are one of those people who are worried about things like fluoride, if you're worried about some of the... Um, Issues that we do have in this country, such as antibiotics and uh, prescription drugs and all the things that can still be found in trace amounts in some supplies of water. You know, there's home filtering systems that you can get. There's other ways that you can get your water safely without going out and necessarily harvesting it yourself from a source that you really don't know where it's coming from. Now, this particular company that we're talking about, they do say on their website that they test the water and that it is checked um, for quality assurance. So that's one thing. They have the ability to do that. But if they're advocating that you just go out and find your own water, uh, like you, James, I disagree with that completely because, again, if you're not getting it from the exact same source that this company is, and I'm sure they're not because otherwise they wouldn't have a business, you are putting yourself in danger. You're putting your family in danger. Um, just because you think something is coming from a natural spring or a natural source does not necessarily mean that it's not at some point interacting with 
runoff from agricultural fields, um, a whole host of other chemical cocktails that can be in that water. And as a matter of fact, you know, we can kind of look at some of this and toss it back to a time in history. So question for you guys. Do you remember the story of Otzi the Iceman? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, so remember, he was found frozen um, up there in the mountains and um, in Austria, I believe it was. And uh, he was from the, the Copper Age. You know, they found all these, these fantastic um, artifacts on his person. But what they also found was that Otzi the Iceman had a case of what's, uh, of a, what's known as a whip worm. So a whip worm, or a trichurus trichura, is basically a parasitic infection. Yeah. Um, this infection can come from um, these eggs that are found usually in warm, damp soils, but they can also be easily transmitted through water um, as they're being washed out of the soil and into a water source, and then you drink them, and then you end up with these severe intestinal uh, issues as you go up throughout your life. It's very hard sometimes to get rid of these. Um, and as a matter of fact, when they found him, they found these two little lumps that were with him that first they thought they were uh, tender for starting fires, but Austrian microbiologists actually identified them as being fruit of the birch fungus. And that in that particular area is known that if it's ingested, it can bring on short bouts of extreme diarrhea. Um, it also contains oils that are toxic to certain parasitic bacteria. So they are basically like a, na- a nature's antibiotic, if you will. And then the diarrhea that it uh, causes you to have pushes the worms and the eggs out of your intestines. How lovely. So again, we take that back to, we don't know that Otzi necessarily got that from a polluted water source. But Again, that's something to keep in mind when you're thinking about these things. And that's only one of many potential health hazards that you can get from drinking untreated water. Certainly. You know, I've, like I, we talked about earlier, I've done a lot of backpacking. I've drank out of streams. I've drank out of springs. But I always, always, always filter the water before I drink it with a, you know, a handheld uh, uh, filtration bottle or whatever. And before people realize that you could get sick from from drinking contaminated water when they knew when they didn't know to separate sewage from drinking water or whatever. One of the biggest killers in uh, human history is cholera. And sometimes you'll still see outbreaks of cholera in uh, third world countries or countries where uh, there's been a natural disaster of some kind. And now they can't treat their water. Like in Haiti, when there was a big earthquake a few years ago, there were a lot of people that died from cholera and that comes directly from untreated drinking water. So, but now that we figured that out in industrialized nations, you know, in Europe and uh, North America and whatever, that's probably largely responsible for the improvement in human life expectancy. We probably added 30 years uh, to our life expectancy overall just from having good, clean, treated water. So, folks, like Jason said before, if you're worried about the things that may be in your treated water, buy a, buy a water filter, buy a whole home water filter, and do not drink raw water from anywhere in fact you know that reminds me of of something too and this kind of ties in with this theme of you know getting out on the trail and hiking and things like that i want to propose a new segment that we'll do here from time to time on the seven ages audio journal (laughs) wilderness survival So if you are out there in the wilderness, you're camping, and you run out of fresh water, and you need to be able to have safe water to drink, let's talk for just a moment about how you can survive in the wilderness and obtain water. First, where do you go to find it, and how do you treat it on the spot so that it's drinkable? Now, of course, you don't want to typically go to a stream or river, take water directly out of that source, considering all the potential for contaminants in that water, and drink that. And interestingly, right up here, in uh, just outside of Asheville, North Carolina, you can hike to what are called the headwaters of the Pigeon River, which are near graveyard fields off the Blue Ridge Parkway. I've never made it. I've tried a couple of times and never made it all the way up, but they say if you trace uh, the source of the water all the way back up into the mountains to its source, you can find an area where there's literally a hole in the rock where the water comes out of. You know, This, again, being relatively safe water to drink, this is still raw water, but not having passed through a number of different sources. Ideally, that kind of spring water, people often say anecdotally, if it's dripping off rocks, it's safe to drink. Would either of you, maybe our environmental scientist friend here, like to comment on that? Is it really safe to drink spring water if it's dripping off of or coming out of rocks? 
No, basically the idea was that you didn't want to drink from stagnant water. So therefore, if it was moving, um, you know, some people would ascribe to the old notion that water moving over gravel or small rocks, that those rocks would act as a filtration system. Now, it will, you know, grab, if you will, because that's what gra gravel tends to do. It will grab some larger particulates, uh, but still the water is flowing over that. And if there's any contamination anywhere upstream or even inside the earth before it actually comes out that it's picking up, it's going to, you know, carry that right along with it. So just because water is moving and it looks pristine, you still never know what the source is or where it's coming from to begin with. Well, what's the safest place to get your water then? James, I mean, maybe you could... I would say out of the tap. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I'm, we're talking about wilderness time here. We're out well, in the woods. If you have to get water and you were miles from civilization, where would, gentlemen, the safest place to get that water be if you can find such a source? Okay, well, let me give you some qualifiers here for this. Um, if you did not have a, a water filtration system, you but you had the ability to make fire, you could make yourself one. You could use sand from a stream. If you had something to boil water in, you could boil water. But, you know, if you're kind of, you know, well, I, in a bond, so I plan to get could, around to how we can purify water in a second. But, uh, you know, again, just, yeah. and I'll let you continue, but I mean, I'm trying to figure out what is the safest water source that one could find in nature. Honestly, even though I've, you know, I've railed against the spring, probably a spring may be the safest place. But here's the thing is if you're downstream, even with the spring from any kind of like agricultural operation or a human habitation or anything like that, there's really none of that water safe to drink. There's, I mean, you're just, you're kind of in trouble there. So even if I have like a handheld water filtration system, a lot of those won't take out any chemicals or like nitrates or nitrites. And I don't know if you've ever heard of blue baby syndrome, but back in the, in the olden days when people had uh, farms and had their own livestock, a lot of times newborns would not live longer than about a year or two. And they would, they would take on this blue cast and people didn't know what it was. They just thought it was just kind of one of those things that happened. But what it is, is, is the nitrates from, uh, from the runoff from hog operations, from the water that flows over the fecal material from the hogs, causes hemoglobin not to, uh, or oxygen not to bond to hemoglobin in the bloodstream, which would cause kind of like a suffocation through your blood, which caused the babies to turn blue because they weren't getting proper oxygen. So if they didn't survive it, it, did, it doesn't affect adults or older children, but only the babies. So my point is, if there's if you're downstream from that, there's no safe place to get drinking water unless you brought it with you. Yeah, and like you were saying, coming back to how you can either filter or otherwise sterilize your water in the field, of course, boiling the water will kill those natural microbes, bacteria, right. things like that. One of the interesting things that I've read about in terms of natural filtration in the woods, most would not find themselves in a situation where they would have to do this, but some of the survivor types out there have and inevitably will, uh, utilizing something like bark from the from the wood of a, of a birch tree or something along those lines to make a simple funnel, which you layer with charcoal, with gravel and sand in different layers, repeating those three, and then you pour your water through that, which provides a natural filtration. And that also will get most of those things out. But I think that probably the safest bet is to boil it, right? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the filter, the sand filter with the charcoal will get, um, you know, most of the stuff out and in boiling, it's always good. So that, and that's what I was going to say. That's, that's about the best way you can do it, but they make activated charcoal filter bottles and things that you can take with you. Um, and even when, like, even if I cook on the trail, I I'll still filter the water before I cook with it just to be, just to be safe because you don't want to get out there, you know, and have some kind of, severe intestinal issue i mean you could get you could get in some serious uh dire straits absolutely uh, one more reason guys that in ancient egypt they preferred to drink wine <laughs> well as in most ancient cultures but you know speaking of egypt let's be sure that we don't offend our uh, nation or our, our uh, government when we're talking about our water resources and uh, what i'm referring to here is this fascinating story uh, it's actually in the news right now of an Egyptian pop singer, uh, Shireen Abdel Wahib, who's actually been brought up on charges in Egypt, charges of harming the public interest after she was filmed uh, in between songs at a concert saying that drinking from the Nile River would make her sick. Now, as fascinating as this sounds, and it's hard to believe that, you know, she could actually be brought up on charges for this. Apparently, it's not that unusual in this uh, region of the world. Now, what happened was in between two songs that was being filmed at a concert, there was a 
concert goer who was filming her with, with the phone. And uh, during a quiet moment, one of the fans yelled out, uh, have you ever drank from the Nile, which is actually one of her songs. Oh. Uh, her reply was, drinking from the Nile will give me Bill Harza, which is another name for schistosomastis, which is a uh, parasitic disease that people in Egypt have battled for many decades. And then she told the, the crowd goers to drink Evian instead. Huh. Um, <laughs> apparently, this didn't sit well with the authorities who have now uh, actually brought her up on charges. Um, she was subsequently banned from the Musician Syndicate, uh, which is a government ages, agency in Egypt that grants permission for various musicians to play in that country. Um, she did apologize, of course, saying that, you know, it was misunderstood and taken out of context that she, you know, didn't mean to offend anyone. She did apologize. But um, I looked earlier to try to find a verdict. They said that her trial was scheduled for December 23rd of 2017, but I didn't see any update on whether or not she was actually jailed because previous cases involving this same charge, people have been jailed up to two years. So right. um, there you have it. Uh, Egypt does not take it lightly when you say that the water from the Nile could potentially make you sick. This comes back to something that I've often had a bit of trouble with, especially as it relates to archaeology in that country. That, And we're going to talk about this a little more because we're going to be doing, of course, a, a lengthier segment on uh, Egypt archaeology and, of course, life in Egypt in ancient times. But you would think that this would fall under common sense and uh, public health concerns not a sort of what you might even effectively call a nationalistic adherence to, well, we got to protect our, uh, you know, our reputation and things like this. And if a pop singer gets up there and says something bad about one of our waterways, whether or not it's actually true, and in the public health interest, she's going to be charged with this. I mean, that just seems so bizarre. There's really quite a cultural divide where you've got two worlds that, that see an issue like this, as I sit here talking with a geologist and an environmental scientist uh, that see these, this issue so differently. I am reminded also, guys, because over the holidays, something that we all did was we watched the BBC series Egypt. And I'm reminded of in the last two episodes with, uh, well, actually, it, but yeah, I guess it was, wasn't it Champollion as he was traveling along, somebody hands him water from the Nile. They just scoop water out of the, out of the river and just hand it to him in a glass to drink. Yes, they do. And they were refilling their canteens. And I got to tell you, <laughs> when they, they dipped down and filled that canteen up out of this water that was completely turbid, I mean, there was just giant particulates floating around it. I was thinking to myself right then, I'm like, oh, this has got to play into the story. He's obviously going to get sick or something. And I was just waiting and waiting and waiting. He did eventually fall ill, but they never necessarily traced it back to that source. But yeah, I was like screaming at the TV. I'm like, oh, don't drink that, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that stuff is unnerving to me. Even when I watch a movie where, you know, like a Western where they dip the water out of them, I'm like, oh, God, it's just not going to go well. Yeah, absolutely not. Well, you know, looking to the ancient past, that may have been how people got their water back in the day, which, again, coming back to my fundamental statement, wine was often seen as preferential for drinking because the alcoholic content helped prevent sickness when people drank it. But wine wasn't all that people were drinking, as we see in ancient Egypt. And there was a lot more going on in the ancient world of Egypt. I mentioned that BBC series, which we all watched. And maybe in the next segment, when we come back, we'll talk a little more about that. Because, you know, again, I think that the appeal, the fascination, and in many ways, really, the birth of modern archaeology as we know it can all kind of be associated with Egypt. And all of the aforementioned being reasons that it has maintained its appeal over the ages. We'll delve into that more here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Speaking of Egypt and all things Egyptian, we've recently found this little treasure on Netflix called Egypt. Uh, this was a BBC show that's been out for a couple years now, but we've made our way through the six episodes that were available on Netflix. 
And I gotta say, this particular show was uh, not quite what I expected when I first clicked on it, but a pleasant surprise in the long run. Um, you have six episodes there, uh, three two-part series, each one of those focusing on a different sort of icon of Egyptology. Uh, and it's going back to some of the earlier times of the very first excavations and some of the monumental discoveries that were made uh, there off the, uh, the beautiful River Nile. So the first two episodes, we focused around the story of the discovery of by Howard Carter of Tutankhamun's tomb in the Valley of the Kings. And uh, the way that they've decided to set this show up was, was really interesting because it's sort of like part documentary, but also part drama. So while you do have actors and you do have people that are you know, acting out of script, it will refer back to what was happening there according to the actual history of the area. So therefore it makes a, a really engaging show, uh, one that, definitely sucked me in and man the story of howard carter no matter how many times you hear it when you see it actually put on film and the way that they presented it extremely powerful and i can only imagine uh, what howard carter had to go through uh, in order to get to where he eventually found the tomb because as we learned in the series he was literally down to the last minute jason that really Egypt really is a great show, and I'm glad you guys uh, turned me on to it. But I've got a confession to make here. I've, I've only watched the first four episodes. I haven't, I haven't got to the last two yet. But the, uh, the one about Howard Carter, it really is, is good. And I didn't know all the backstory about how his financiers and these, these wealthy uh, um, British, uh, well, British financiers were uh, leading these expeditions to find all these uh, antiquities there which was basically what it, it basically amounted to looting, essentially. Oh, yeah. Well, so much of, again, the antiquarian mindset at that time, which led to science being applied to things, and thus archaeology was born out of it, it really began with collection and, at best, crude classification of things that were found based on the collections of these uh, antiquarians. And so, yeah, there was really a lot of what amounted to being looting that occurred. Howard Carter, again, the first two episodes... When I began watching these back over the holidays, uh, Howard Carter's story has always kind of struck home with and for me. I remember a friend telling me years ago, we were, we were going uh, up on this ridge, and this actually had to do with Native American studies because there was a friend of ours who had private property. And, uh, and I can go ahead and actually tell you, this private property is located adjacent to what's known as Judicola Rock, a large petroglyph here in Western North Carolina uh, that the anthropologist James Mooney wrote about in his uh, landmark book, Myths of the Cherokee. And we were interested in whether there might be caves anywhere in the region, because I've heard stories about this and everything. And so one of the property owners uh, near to the site had given us permission and actually enthusiastically supported a group of us hiking up onto an, a ridge of his property to try and see if there were caves up there. And so I was the team leader, if you will, that led a small group of people uh, across this ridge and up to this area where we thought caves might exist. Unfortunately, there were none. <laughs> the team that stayed on the ground with radios, I remember uh, my friend uh, telling me at the time, he says, when you peer into that cave for the first time, if there is one, he says, I imagine it being like a Howard Carter moment for you, you know, where, where Carter reports back, you know, they ask, you know, Lord Carnarvon saying, you know, what do you see? Can you see anything, old boy? And he says, yes, wonderful things. And so for me, I've always had this deep connection with that. And also in, mis uh, in middle school, my first... Uh, reading of Egyptology was an, a book on Egyptian archaeology and Tutankhamun and the discussion of and the discovery of that uh, tomb by Howard Carter. And I've always had kind of a appreciation for that story. So as I saw the reenactment on the, the Egypt program and I see the actor going in there and everything and reenacting that role, I mean, I had an almost emotional response to that. Just thinking about the enormity of that moment, one of the truly defining moments in archaeology. You know, knowing the history of of Egypt and especially the Valley of the Kings, when Howard Carter first puts that candle through and he utters those words that are now world famous, wonderful things, um, couldn't help but think about, you know, Tutankhamun was a young pharaoh. He died well before uh, he was expected to, and it's kind of accepted that that tomb was sort of just haphazardly thrown together because his tomb wasn't ready for him uh, dying at such a young age. So 
things were just sort of stacked in there. It was kind of done quickly, um, not to the degree that we see of pharaohs like Seti the First and Ramses the Great and Amenhotep the Third and all these different really prominent, um, highly influential pharaohs. So, you know, being that Tutankhamun was even basically a minor pharaoh, but still had such treasures that were locked away. Can you imagine what must have been in those tombs before they were looted of pharaohs like Seti I and Ramses the Great and Amenhotep III? Um, it must have been um, unimaginable because you see the scale and the size of those pharaohs' tombs when they have been found, although the treasures have all been taken away. The, the sheer scale of the tombs is unreal so i can only imagine the treasures that have been lost one can maybe hope that at some point some of the lost treasures of antiquity will uh, be reclaimed because you figure that you know when the looting took place now granted uh, there are some instances where things like you know gold trinkets and the like may have been melted down those of course naturally can't be reclaimed but i, I still hold out hope that perhaps there's some information uh, that can be gleaned from the recovery of once lost through looting artifacts that perhaps are still in existence someplace and maybe have made their way to private collections or maybe are even in uh, larger collections at museums and things, but have not been identified as such. Yeah. Uh, yeah I think we were talking off the air uh, yesterday. We were talking about this and uh, somebody mentioned that black market uh, antiquities dealing is second only to the international drug trade and the amount of money that's involved. Oh yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, you know, whether it's, Museums, you know, they only have so much that's actually in there. And then you just have, you know, multimillionaire private collectors. You have uh, dictators who collect art. You have drug dealers and cartel people, all kinds of different people. And then you actually have um, legitimate collectors who are looking for things as well. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of these black market um, acquisitions, if you will, are connected with terrorist groups. They're connected with all sorts of unsavory characters, if you will. Um, as you can imagine, would be the ones that are actually looting and taking from uh, places like we see in Egypt. And I know at one point in the future, we'll go into this much, much more in depth on one of our uh, shows where we specialize just on that topic. But one thing to keep in mind is the other big problem that we see with the looting is there's so many fakes and forgeries now as well that you never know. Ultimately, if you were to come across one of these ancient treasures, you always have that question in the back of your head. Is it actually real? Is it authentic? Because the ability for people to forge these has gotten so good oftentimes that you almost can't tell the difference in, unless you have microscopes and, and you really have an eye and you've had a long history with looking at artifacts. You really can't tell the difference between what's authentic and what's not. And sometimes the reproductions are even better than the original product. It seems about every six months or so, there's a story in the news about some artifact that's found that has great historic significance of some kind. And then within a, within another two or three months, it's found out that it, it's, it's actually a fake. Well, yeah, uh, I know there was, uh, there was some stuff from the Holy land uh, that had to do with uh, possibly Jesus's tomb a couple of years ago. And I think that turned out to be uh, turned out to be a forgery of some kind. There's that. Uh, we also have the illegal importation and resale of things, as we found with the Hobby Lobby thing from uh, middle 2017. Uh, we have, on the very first episode of this podcast, during the interview we featured with Dr. J.M. Atavasio, we mention a Mastodon carving from Vero Beach. And th this, again, is something that some look at it and say uh, that this is the earliest instance of art from North America you know, engraved in mammoth bone. Others look at it and say, we're convinced that this is a hoax. Now, keep in mind, radiocarbon information from within the engraved portions of the, the bone seem to indicate, according to those who are proponents of its authenticity, that it is of the antiquity that the discoverer uh, has alleged. The problem, as Dr. Atavasio pointed out to us with that relic, is that the discoverer is remarkably vague, to use Atavasio's own terms, in terms of where that actually was found and how it was acquired. So you're, you're always going to encounter that issue with, you know, fraudulent things. Jason, I know you've talked about this an awful lot. And again, this, like you said, could be a whole, ep whole episode, but people who present what they claim to be, uh, you know, a lithic, a stone point from one location and from a certain kind of antiquity, but without any kind of context for its discovery or proof, 
that verifies its location and thus its age stratigraphically or otherwise sometimes uh, there are instances where something can look really good and it can as the old saying goes be far too good to be true and it's entirely been you know brought to a person with the expectation that the buyer will not be aware of the nuances of this and that they will buy something and that they will totally be taken advantage of yeah and it's an ongoing problem we find it in native american artifacts we find it in egyptian antiquities uh, pieces coming out of iraq and iran i mean it's it's just the way of it i mean so you if you are going to be a collector if you are interested in these type of things you serves you well to really brush up on understanding what you need to be looking for in forgeries and even then with the technology and the the advent of these truly fine artisans who are forging these things sometimes you still can't even tell um, you can have an authentic piece right beside a reproduction and uh, to especially to the untrained eye there's no way you're going to be able to tell the difference um, referring back to the bbc series egypt for just a moment uh, we talked about howard carter uh, but you know, someone who was sort of a champion of rescuing some of these original artifacts was the third and fourth episode, which focused on this sort of larger than life character, Giovanna Belzoni. Yeah. And, you know, I found his story very intriguing. Here he is going up and down the Nile, trying his very best to essentially rescue some of these treasures for the British Museum, only to find out that his benefactors, who are supposedly representing the British Museum, are looking only to profit from the sales of these artifacts themselves. So it's set up for a uh, very interesting and controversial situation for him that he had to overcome and, and come to grips with himself because he realized that he very well may be contributing to some of the issues that we're talking about right here today. Yeah, Belzoni's story is fascinating to me. I, uh, you know, again, there's something that's very lovable about the idea of this gigantic um, explorer and of course he really wants more than anything I think to be remembered for something and sure make a little money along the way but he ended up becoming this passionate advocate for the protection of uh, these antiquities and the removal and, and the well when necessary and also the acquisition and, and uh, upkeep maintenance you know the preservation of these antiquities Belzoni's story is very interesting because I've looked into this uh, quite a bit. There are a lot of books about him, and although I think m many archaeologists have felt a need to kind of vindicate Belzoni, because some people are like, this guy was a... He didn't know half of what he acted like he did, of course. He was an uneducated, loud, and just a step above a looter himself. Uh, many archaeologists who have actually written, and also biographers who have written uh, of the life of Belzoni, see him very differently. They say this guy uh, has been very misunderstood, and at times also wrongly accused of playing a negative role in the acquisition and preservation of these antiquities and that actually Belzoni's work was not only landmark and, and really truly historical but also he was one of these characters in those formative years where we saw a progression out of just antiquarians and collectors it moving into let us collect and preserve and respect and then with the collection and the preservation and the respect for these antiquities that are recovered from places like Egypt or any place else in the world then let us study these things with rigorous scientific procedures that help us learn about the past in a methodical way so you know again belzoni really i think often mischaracterized as just this great big brute who was going out there and dragging statues out of the desert in truth he really played a very significant role i think in the progression toward modern archaeology as a science you know the bbc series was really pretty kind to him they they you know they went into his background and showed how he had been you know he's an italian engineer uh, by trade but he didn't have much luck at that and uh, he had been a like a circus strongman and eventually made his way to uh, Egypt. But he was also, the guy was a very shrewd businessman. Um, he was able to, you know, acquire the acquire the labor. I won't go into the details of it if you haven't seen the series because it's really worth watching. Right, yeah. You know, he's able to negotiate with the uh, local uh, power structure there to get the uh, labor he needed to move the artifacts around and do the things that he needed to do. But one of the things, especially in the second episode of his, his story, Danielle and I, my wife, we were watching this and I put myself in his place in a way. I thought, how exciting must have that have been to be able to go and be the first person to see these, you know, see these places uh, excavated in over two or 3000 years. To me, that, that really speaks to the adventurer that's, you know, it's in my soul. Yeah, it truly does. And, 
you know, we never, when you look at things that are portrayed through the media in, in ways like this, you, you don't know, you don't really know what was going on in the person's mind at that time. Um, but you can certainly sort of put yourself in their position and, and think about what it would have been like to see some of these treasures and some of these temples for the very first time uh, in, in thousands of years. The series wraps up with the story of Jean-Francois Champollion, which I think out of all three of them, uh, I think I can say this, Micah, that maybe you and I connected with Champollion the, the most because he seemed to have this insatiable drive for knowledge. And, you know, you and I often complain that there's just not enough hours in the day uh, to read everything that we want to read. And James, I know you, you feel that way as well. There's so many things that we're collectively interested in here at Seven Ages and so many things that we want to read about and research and go out and excavate and be part of. There simply is just not enough days in the week and there's not enough hours in the day. So we saw this sort of brought right out in front of us on screen by Champollion, who was driven to decipher hieroglyphics. So, you know, there was a race between the French and the British. Uh, the British had possession of the Rosetta Stone and it was sort of a race to see who uh, could decipher the hieroglyphics, not only for what they would reveal about Egyptology, but sort of has a point of pride for their nations. And But to watch Champollion, he was so obsessed, it almost reminded me of almost like a Nikola Tesla type character who is so ingrained with the knowledge and, and seeking out these things that he you know, almost can't eat or sleep or concentrate on anything other than uh, that obsession and really um, whether it was exaggerated by the show, we don't really know, but we know that it would have taken a great deal of effort and knowledge to decipher the hieroglyphics in the way that they were done. Uh, but what a reward to society to finally be able to unlock uh, that particular script and to be able to understand finally what the Egyptians were trying to tell us. Oh gosh. Yeah. I mean, I, again, Champollion's story, truly, you're correct, Jason. It truly resonated with me. Um, I see a lot of myself in that character a guy, you know, who he gets up, he starts his work and he doesn't stop working until the end of the day and uh, just has this, this insatiable drive. But I think all of us share that to an extent. And it's really um, grown that aspect of myself since the seven ages research associates became a thing. And seeing Champollion and, and understanding the, again, what he was up against, really, if anyone had had the upper hand, it should have been uh, Thomas Young himself, his his English counterpart, who it was sort of a race between Young and Champollion representing uh, Britain and France to try and decipher what the mystery of the hieroglyphs were, or if indeed there was a language there apart from mere symbols. Champollion, of course, helps decipher this. But again, Thomas Young had in his possession at that time the Rosetta Stone. One of the, if not probably within the top 10 greatest discoveries from antiquity, something that truly, I mean, that was the only way that we would have stood any chance of deciphering these languages. Without that discovery, we may never have uncovered what the mysteries of ancient Egypt's language and as Champollion shows us through the proper decipherment of the hieroglyphs. He cracks that code and he's able to go in and he understands aspects of the mythic traditions and the religion, belief in the afterlife, and all of these things. And what role they played in Egyptian society. And again, yeah, in the final moments of the BBC documentary series on Egypt, where they show Champollion there in the tomb, and he's putting it all together, and they mention some of the things. Again, one that just absolutely stands out, and I just have to mention it here, is they mention a serpent with a fire in his mouth. We see the, the incredible prevalence of that serpent uh, as a motif shared throughout so many cultures in antiquity, from prehistoric times to present. I got chills. I got absolute chills thinking about these these incredible historical people, you know, the role that they played in discovery and acquisition of knowledge. And again, for those who ascribe only to fringe attitudes about the ancient past, well, the academicians have got it all wrong. And ha, Egyptologists who think they know everything. I challenge people who are merely of a fringe way of thinking about these kinds of subjects to study what the academicians know, where that information comes from, and the history of, I've always loved the history of science, Look at the history of how we know what we know. Look at Champollion. Look at what Howard Carter discovered. Look at the role that Giovanni Belzoni played. Understand the premise upon which we build the knowledge that we've accumulated and what we call 
ancient Egypt and what we know of that society. Read books by Professor Barry Kemp and others. You know, study the academic perspectives before you discount it and say that they're wrong. Sure, there's always going to be room for more knowledge, but again, there are you know mentalities among some out there that anyone who claims to work for a university and have answers about the ancient past must be wrong because they fall into the consensus view on things. On the other hand, you also have the academicians who sometimes will say that there's no room for further knowledge because we really have a pretty clear picture of what was going on in the ancient past. In fact, I saw a little of that with one of the big stories of the last year, which involved the discovery of that chamber, a new chamber in the Great Pyramid. A lot of division about this, people saying this is the single greatest discovery uh, in the last century as it relates to the Great Pyramid. And then there are others, for instance, you know, Antiquities Minister Zahi Hawass saying this is not a significant discovery and there's nothing new that we've learned about Egypt from this. And further, the researchers who have released the information jumped the gun and shouldn't have done so without our consent, so to speak. Uh, a lot of division on attitudes, which I can't help but think sometimes really come back down to ego more than anything else. Well, we look back to the time of Howard Carter and Belzoni and Champollion, and we look at how things were done back then. And, you know, honestly, the most majority of archaeology these days, sometimes you just have to dig. Uh, but it is exciting with this new technology that's being used um, as what we see with this new chamber that's been discovered within the Great Pyramid there on the Giza Plateau. Um, new technology that, you know, it's, it's kind of burgeoning. It's, it's moving uh, Egyptology and archaeology as a whole forward. And this particular discovery seems to indicate a 153-foot-long and 26-foot-tall corridor um, above the King's Chamber in the Great Pyramid that was completely unknown about uh, previously. Um, now, this comes from what's known as the Scan Pyramids Project. And now, this is an international mission under the authority of Egypt's uh, Ministry of Antiquities, obviously, um, this was launched back in October of 2015. Now, what they're doing, rather than you know digging or dynamiting, drilling some of the things that have been used in the past, uh, what they're using is a non-invasive um, battery of technologies, if you will, to sort of see through the pyramid without actually having to destroy anything. This technique has actually been used in Europe to look through cathedral walls. Uh, it's looked through Mayan pyramids in Central and South America, and even volcanoes. So what it does is it relies on the natural drizzle, if you will, of subatomic particles called muons. Um, these particles shower the earth all the time, and basically they're flung off when cosmic rays of high energy particles uh, collide with earth's upper atmosphere. Uh, while that's kind of hard to follow, basically it's a, a new innovative technology that allows them to sort of peer through these giant monuments without having to go in and destroy anything. And using this technique, they have seemed to at least discover this new corridor, although it has been dismissed, dismissed by people like Hawass, who don't seem to put much credit into it. But I honestly don't see how you can dismiss something until you've either proven it to be there or not be there. So I think at a minimum, it warrants further investigation. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what's going to be found in the coming year. Uh, and I would love to see this technology implemented at archaeological sites all over the world, if it truly does uh, and is accurate as they claim it to be, it could be a real innovative step forward without having to go in and destroy some of these archaeological sites. Well, think about, for instance, some of the earlier <laughs> excavations, if you want to call them, that uh, uh, Richard William Howard Weiss carried out there in Egypt, where gunpowder was literally employed to blow open chambers and things along those lines. The new compartment that they were talking about, though, again, in this study that the uh, Scam Pyramids Project has revealed is a large chamber of some kind. We don't know all that much about the shape. We have a rough idea of the size that it comprises, and it's above the gallery, you know, which is actually more like a, a tunnel actually kind of leading up into the king's chamber. Uh, some have thought that, and again, structurally, that this might have been an empty chamber that was left intentionally empty so as to reduce strain and stress on the rest of the the actual pyramidal mass so that the structure wouldn't again falter or there wouldn't be too much weight holding it down that this this empty chamber could have been designed with the intent of lessening that strain of the weight of all the stone blocks so 
But like you said, Jason, it's weird to me that uh, Zai Hawass and others would look at this and say, absolutely nothing to see here. We have learned nothing new about Egypt. That's absolutely not accurate. If it's, an, if it's a hollow chamber that had a structural purpose in terms of the design of the pyramids, we have learned something about the architecture employed by the builders. And that is indeed, from an engineering standpoint, very good uni- uh, information to have. So do either one of you guys know exactly how they plan to explore this chamber? I know in the past, uh, I think it was back in the 90s, they had they discovered those shafts and they, they had some kind of little robotic a device that went up through and, and uh, looked around, but I, I, it doesn't sound like that this is going to lend itself to that type of technology. From what I understand and what I've heard described is they do plan on drilling a very small hole into the chamber, and then they're building currently a custom-made inflatable camera robot, if you will, that's supposed to float across the chamber rather than drive across the bottom because they don't know what might be inside the chamber. So they, they want to go at it from kind of drifting and floating across it to see if there's anything to be filmed or if it's just truly a hollow chamber left over from the construction of the pyramid. Yeah, and you know, something else too, I mean, as we're kind of wrapping up our Egypt section here, uh, if you head over to sevenages.org, we have an article on an, another I think fascinating discovery that has come out only recently as it relates to ancient Egypt. This not pertaining so much to the architecture and the structures there on the Giza Plateau, but actually one of the less likely places one would think to look for messages from the past. So back in the old days in ancient Egypt, of course, there was a very different economic structure. There wasn't necessarily a monetary system like what we have. It was actually much more like a barter kind of a system. But people did indeed utilize papyri, okay, for writing notes that are akin to the kinds of things that we would use today, receipts or lists for things that they meant to acquire at market, even you know what could be likened to ancient tax returns. Now, these papyrus, again, weren't always kept for all eternity by these people. If anything, many of them ended up being recycled and reused, and almost in a fashion similar to paper mache, sometimes these waste papyrus would be repurposed and used in the casing that went around mummies that were then placed inside sarcophagi. Now, by unraveling these waste papyrus and looking at them and then putting them under different kinds of light, researchers have recently revealed that there had been markings, writings on these that give us a very different perspective on ancient life in Egypt. Because if you think about it like this, you know, the the markings and the hieroglyphs and the writings that are on the interior of the tombs themselves of the actual Egyptian pharaohs, it's kind of like, as, and in fact, some of the researchers involved with this study have referred to it as such. They say it's like the propaganda of its era. These pharaohs, they had written on the walls of their tombs what they wanted to be said about themselves and how they wanted to be remembered, you know, for all to come, for centuries to come. And so when we see these papyrus that have been, again, repurposed and recycled and reused, and they have writing on them, they tell us things about the more everyday aspects of ancient Egyptian life, unlike those who necessarily were living in royalty. And I think that's fascinating because it's one of the least likely places you'd think to look for information about the ancient past, but what it reveals is something that, again, has not necessarily in other instances stood the test of time being perishable material as it is. Michael, when I read this story, one of the things that popped in my mind was I thought to myself, I wonder if they had some kind of recycle bins around town or around, you know, in the palaces. So when you're done with your with, with your papyrus scrap, you just throw it in the bin and then they collect it later and then they repurpose it for these for these other things. So I imagine a little recycle uh, emblem with the papyrus going into the bucket there. Well, you never know. I mean, it may very well be that, again, that's one aspect that we were meant to learn about all of this and that, you know, again, we find uh, aspects of ancient life in ancient Egypt thousands of years ago that's not entirely dissimilar from what we do here in the modern era. Well, if you take away the propaganda and and all the things that we've learned to recognize over the years, really, it it always is the garbage pits that tell you the most about a society. And whether it's Egypt or even Native American sites that we work on here, we, we look for that debutage. We look for that rock flaking. So we are looking for indicators that someone was there. And then we're looking for, okay, by the basically the the debris that they've left here, we know what kind of materials they were using, what they were implementing in their daily lives. And, you know, in places like Egypt and in Rome and and all these different places, those garbage heaps can tell you more than anything. And if you think about it today, think about your own trash that you set up beside the road. 
someone were to go through that trash, they know what you eat. They know what your habits are around your house. They know what junk mail you've thrown out, what credit cards you may have. That's why they always say you need to have a shredder in your house to make sure that you're keeping all that information secure. But think about how much can be learned just by sifting through someone's trash. So a a garbage pile or something in this case, a mummy uh, containing pieces of scrap, that little bit of information that thousands of years ago was so insignificant can now open up an entire world to archaeologists and collectors and really give you some insight to what exactly was happening in the daily life of those people, which I think is often more interesting than the grandiose um, kings and pharaohs and all these people who lived sort of a isolated life. I've always been much more interested, archaeologically speaking, about the daily lives of the normal people. What was it like to just be a citizen in Egypt three or four thousand years ago? Rounding out another fine conversation over here at the Cross Time Pub. It's always so cool to get together with you guys and sit down, have a beverage, and look at the past. Why is it that the past always seems so much more inviting and even enchanting than the modern day? I'm sure that there's an illusion to that. But then again, I mean, trying to put ourselves in the minds of what it was like to live in ancient times or even more recent times. Uh, I remember uh, Howard Phillips Lovecraft, of course, the author of Weird Fiction, had said that one of the most constant themes in all of his writing involved humankind and its conflict with time. And I think that part of our fascination with the past has a lot to do with that conflict with time. And like you said earlier in the program, Jason, the issue that we face in terms of trying to learn as much as we can within the short time that we spend here on Earth and trying to unravel what seem to be at times insurmountable riddles, unfathomable things from the ancient past... And every now and then you also see that uh, what you look to the past and find is not everyday and ordinary. Odd bits of history. That's right. In tonight's installment of Odd Bits of History, we examine the story of Boston Corbett. Now, if that name doesn't ring a bell to you, you just need to know that Boston Corbett is to the assassination of President Lincoln, what Jack Ruby was to the assassination of President Kennedy. They were both crazy, in other words. Exactly. So nursing a broken leg, no doubtly in a lot of pain, Booth had made it 73 miles down to Port Royal, Virginia. Now at this time, federal troops were in hot pursuit. Uh, They knew they wanted him. They wanted him alive more than anything because they wanted the questions asked of why would you do this? But on that night, has Union... Soldiers surrounded the barn where they found Booth. It was a soldier by the name of Boston Corbett who would ultimately decide the fate of the assassin of President Abraham Lincoln. And once again, he seemed to be crazy. See, the weird parallels here, okay, between, and and in fact, there have often been these almost mythological parallels made between Kennedy and Lincoln's assassination. But here there are at least a few similarities that arise, not only in the fact that we had a uh, assassin who escapes and then later is shot dead, but shot dead by an equally strange and troubled individual. Uh, Jack Ruby, of course, in the case of Lee Harvey Oswald, and in this case, Corbett in the case of John Wilkes Booth. Now, Corbett had had a bit of a sordid history of his own. He'd been something of a religious zealot. James, I know that you joked about his, his role in the hat industry, but also that that could have uh, presented environmental concerns in terms of his behavior, right? Certainly, yeah. He, uh, in the hat making business of those days, they used mercury uh, vapor in part of the production process, which can give you heavy metal poisoning and cause you to have all types of problems, but it can 
cause you to have mental problems, essentially. I mean, he definitely seemed to be a strong candidate for this. Uh, probably the best evidence of this. So he's out there on a street corner. They'd said that he would show up where the, you know, the, the, the ministers standing out there, you know, preaching on the street corners would go and he would be, you know, see, heaping hallelujahs and he'd be singing along. And so they tell him, you should go do this yourself and be your own street corner preacher because basically they were trying to get rid of him. He's standing there, he's preaching, and apparently a couple of prostitutes, ladies of the night, walk by. He's perhaps not compelled to join the ladies, but nonetheless, his body responds accordingly. And distraught at the fact that this occurs, he goes home and castrates himself. Doesn't check himself into a hospital. No, he goes to dinner instead, and then for a walk about the town. Then several hours later, he checks himself into the hospital. Now, you have to ask yourself about the mentality of a person who, in their in their own religiousness, would castrate themselves and then go to dinner that same night. This is Boston Corbett. Well, in the Bible, in the book of Matthew 19.12, it says, There are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And apparently, Corbett took that to heart. So, you know, rather than reacting to the advancement of those prostitutes in a logical way that maybe you just go walk it off, maybe you go have a drink, um, maybe you say a prayer if you're a religious man to kind of offset those feelings that you you just had. Now, in the case of Boston Corbett, you got to imagine he's thinking about this scenario as he's getting closer to his home and, and trying to decide the best course of action. And somewhere between that street corner and his home, he decided that self-castration must be the right answer. That's so an that awful- gives you some real insight into exactly this character that we're talking about. Uh, And further so, the fact that after doing the self-castration, he goes to a prayer meeting. Then he goes to dinner. And then he says, you know what? Maybe I should have this addressed. He's a guy that he doesn't like temporary fixes. He likes permanent fixes. Yeah, Talk about odd bits indeed. Well, Well, again, and this is the guy who... Again, let's let's fast forward, which is still going back in time, to the night where John Wilkes Booth is not a captive yet, but the idea was they wanted to know, what had he acted alone? Uh, was he put up to this? I mean, there were a lot of questions that remained about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Corbett is standing there and decides to take matters into his own hands. Certainly. So, John Wilkes Booth is in the, is in the barn. He's actually in there with a, one of his co-conspirators who, who surrenders. So they give uh, uh, Booth the ultimatum, hey, come out or we're going to come in. And uh, one of the soldiers uh, lit some hay on fire, threw it in the barn, you know, in an attempt to smoke him out. And in the meantime, Corbett has approached the barn and, and from his own testimony says he can see uh, John Wilkes Booth. In the barn, he's got a rifle in his hand or a sidearm. He sees Booth raise the rifle as if he's going to attack the soldiers. And at that time, Corbett takes a shot at him and hits him, which doesn't kill Booth immediately. I think he probably shot him in the spine. Uh, Booth was paralyzed after that, and I think he passed away the next morning. Yeah. In fact, there was that testimony that they said that in the hours between being shot and paralyzed by uh, Corbett and his death the following morning, John Wilkes Booth asked one of the soldiers that had actually detained him not that he needed detainment at that point but he says lift my hands so that i can see my own hands useless useless he said and then he died so they didn't have time to interrogate him and once again much like the parallel between the kennedy assassination with lee harvey oswald being killed before we can get information further idea about motives about accomplices or anything boston corbett takes it upon himself to assassinate john wilkes booth the assassin of abraham lincoln Man, this guy had been in Andersonville, the uh, POW uh, camp down in Georgia, which was essentially hell on earth. He was lucky to survive it. And then he goes on to his greater fame, which uh, when he got out of the the POW camp after the war, he went back to the Union Army. And the unit that he was in was was sort of like a special forces unit. It was kind of a hand-picked force of men and he happened to be in the unit that ended up down there at at the uh, at the barn where john wilkes booth was yeah so what we see with with corbett is just someone who has lived this this strange and unusual life and it kind of all goes back to earlier in his life he did have a wife and she was pregnant and she died during childbirth 
And so he lost both his soon to be daughter and his wife at the same time. And most people attribute to that particular uh, event in his life to when he essentially came unhinged, if you will, he kind of lost his sense of direction. He lost his sense of self-worth and then he also became an alcoholic. So uh, after getting over alcoholism, going through the war, getting through four years of combat, Andersonville, I think it was when he first started hearing these, these corner preachers that he realized, Hey, there's something bigger out there than myself. And he gave attribution to God for getting him through these situations. Uh, He even goes on to grow his hair out so that he looks like Jesus himself. And it just becomes part of this strange and unusual character that is Boston Corbett. Um, As he moves through his life and all the various things that we've already discussed, he continues this just strange fascination, ultra fervent religious guy who's bouncing around throughout New England and, and just finding himself in all these strange and unusual situations. Uh, some people didn't know whether to, to look at Boston as a patriot for what he had done or, or the reverse of that because they wanted questions, they wanted answers from John Wilkes Booth, and he deprived them the ability to do that. So I guess in retrospect, it's, it's really subjective on how you look at Boston Corbett. Maybe he was a patriot. Maybe uh, John Wilkes Booth should have had the opportunity to go to court and stand trial. You know, he ended up being mostly reviled uh, because of that, and it caused him to leave the East Coast, and he eventually settled in uh, Kansas. I think the last real record of him there was in uh, a town called Neodache, Kansas. And then after that, he uh, nobody really knows what happened to the guy. He uh, might, might have perished in a fire uh, somewhere up in one of the upper tier states. Uh, but the you know that's pretty sketchy the details on that so nobody really knows what happened. He just sort of faded into obscurity as these characters tend to do from time to time. Yeah, and in addition to the speculation about his death, there were also imposters that came forward claiming to have been him, but unable to actually substantiate the circumstances surrounding his assassination of. Abraham Lincoln's assassin, all these kind of things. It's, again, one of those strange and sordid affairs that you often find in history. And again, to at least a certain extent, the similarities to another famous presidential assassination, that of JFK, they're almost undeniable. So it will remain indeed one of the perhaps oddest bits of history that we cover here on this program. Gentlemen, as always, such a good time to kick back, pour a glass or four, and enjoy some conversation with you, societal brothers. Gentlemen, my whistle needs to be wet, so I think it's high time for a pint. Keep those whistles wet, ladies and gentlemen, out there, and be sure and head over to sevenages.org, our website, where you can find information about how to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and also check out our YouTube channel, where you can see videos of our work in the field, and we'll catch you again in a future installment of this podcast. It is the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Audio Journal.